a good Tuesday morning and welcome to Noah's Window. You know, Mary Alice, this is the first time we've had an opportunity to tape since the weekend. And of course, uh, all our attention really uh, for the last few days has been on what's going on in Israel, this horrific, cowardly sucker punch attack from Hamas, clearly uh, facilitated by Iran, probably bankrolled by Iran. and. I'm going to be talking about this. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to do something I don't recall doing in a long time. I'm actually going to suspend the through series and actually go back to the Clash of Dynasties, the Book of Revelation series, because there was a message I left out that's so salient to what's going on. And so I'm actually going to bring that message this weekend and talk about what's going on in Israel right now through the lens of biblical prophecy. And there is so much. Yes. about biblical prophecy that's being fulfilled right before our eyes. But aside from just thinking about the prophecy angle and what God is doing in the long range, you know, your heart and my heart is yes. just torn apart by what we, mm -hmm. what we see happening. We were in those towns. Um, we were at that border crossing. We were at that border crossing in Gaza. Yeah, yes. because we were guests. I think it should be said. We were guests of the foreign minister of Israel. And mm -hmm. our dear friend, Goliath Kotz, who had been on Netanyahu's staff, who was posted to the United States. We became dear friends. He and his family came to New Spring. We had a great night. And then Galad called us and said, hey, would you like to go to Israel with me as guest of the foreign minister? And, uh, you know, Galad and his family are back in Israel right now, and, and we're concerned about them as we're concerned about many friends that we met in Israel. But, you know, as you just pointed out, we were at that border crossing and the police chief who oversaw that crossing where I think there were like eight or nine hundred trucks that would go back and forth between Israel and, and Egypt. Uh, you know, you know, the, the police chief, I remember, never will forget, he told me as we were walking through the compound, he said, if the sirens go off in Tel Aviv, you've got 15 minutes. He said, if our sirens go off, we've got 45 seconds. I don't even think they have that now. Um, and then we went to Sarot, and the deputy mayor took us through and showed us, you know, showed us that beautiful town that we can't get out of our minds. It was such a beautiful town, peaceful people, sweet people, music-loving people. Mm -hmm. And to think about what's going on in Sarot. There was a concert there, that one of the places where the the terrorists came over and just mowed people down. And, you know, concert. I can, I, in my mind, I still see the children riding their bikes in Sarot, mm -hmm. and I see the elderly sitting on benches, and so, you know, they're just the sweetest people in the well, world. Well, in that border crossing to Egypt, I saw a reporter last night who said someone was asking uh, the government, you know, are you going to let the Palestinians come over at that border crossing? And they said, what border crossing? It's been yeah. destroyed. It's and been, so yeah. the friends that we met, oh, I, I remember the the um, police chief there who was in charge of it and we met with him personally for probably a couple of hours yeah, yeah and then just the people there that were taking care of the compound and you think most certainly they've been harmed if not killed and it's yes a hard thing to think and, about. and it is i mean and the, that police chief i remember had been wounded i think three times yes. and you know he would he as, as he would walk through the compound with me, especially if we're on the outside of concrete where the trucks would cross back and forth, he would point out and he'd say, hey, that gas right there is mortar fire. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then Ashkelon, we were there right by Ashkelon, which of course has had so much uh, tragedy. Um, and so again, it's very personal for us. We, you know, <laughs> a lot of people go to Israel to be tourists and that's a wonderful thing and there's a place for that. We were invited by the nation of Israel to see the danger. You know, the foreign ministry wanted us to see the danger that they're in every day. And of course, they took us up on the north border of Syria. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know. We got to hear the heartbeat and the anguish of the people yes. in this uh, uh, ongoing battle, which you and I know this is a spiritual battle. It, it is. In. And, you know, the myth is that the Israelis are hostile to Palestinians. Yeah. and. You know, I was just thinking about when we were at the border crossing, half the guards with automatic weaponry were, were, were Jewish and half were Palestinians, and they were side by side, yes. you know, guarding Israel. And, and so it, it, it is these terrorists, and that is what they are. Yes. They're, they're, you know, Hamas is, is uh, it's not a real, I mean, it's not a real nation. Uh, no. it, is, it, is a, it is a group of people bent on the destruction of the nation of Israel, and that's what it needs to be called that. The United yes. States needs to quit 
fumbling around trying to find some kind of middle ground between the Jewish people who just want peace mm -hmm. and these Palestinian terrorists who are bent on the destruction of Israel and will accept nothing less. I, and, and, and just to point out, not to interrupt you, but not only do they want to just, uh, Israel to be completely ruined and wiped out, they want us to be wiped absolutely. out. Absolutely, yeah. They, 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 they lump America, us in with they Israel. Call America so the great if we can, we can feel far away and safe, but they're after us too. But for all, any, any people who want to find some kind of moral equivalency between the terrorists and, and the Israelis, you need to hear what a, a, a rabbi friend of mine told me many years ago. He said, if the terrorists laid down their weapons, there would be no war. Mm -hmm. He said, if the Israelis laid down their weapons, there would be no, no Israel. Mm -hmm. And and that is that is the difference right there. And unfortunately, it doesn't get told very often. Well, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent because we were going to open the Bible today, but your heart and my heart yes. is deeply touched. And as I thought about Sarot, I just could, couldn't stop weeping. Uh, when this happened because the memories are just so fresh in my mind of how sweet those people were. They were and, and I remember asking, you know, when we, because the deputy mayor was a woman, and she was yes. so kind, yeah. and uh, and you think those people were under attack so almost constantly. Well, and again, I'll probably mention this this coming weekend, but you know, uh, the deputy mayor took us around behind the police station. You remember there was a huge yes. yard that was surrounded was by fence. chain link fence. Uh -huh. And there was all this misshapen metal out there, and she said these are all rockets, what's left over of rockets that have been sent into Sarot, which I think was the most rocket fired upon town yes, in Israel. I think so. And uh, but what, of course, my memory to always get emotional. I think about this was we as we were driving through the streets of Sarot, there were the most beautiful parks, and all these parks had modern art metal. Uh, constructions of musical instruments. There were tubas and pianos and saxophones and trumpets and all these things. There were, there were bright colors out there and I was just taken by it. And I remember I asked Gilad, uh, or I just said, hey, I just find this so interesting that they've got musical instruments you know, in modern art representations made out of metal. And Gilad said all those instruments are made from rockets that were sent over. The other memory I remember, there there were, because there are people living there, men, women, boys, yes, and girls, and there, yeah. there were playgrounds that had oh. like very colorful, long things that looked like a big caterpillar, and they said, that's a bomb shelter. So right. when the sirens go off, the little children playing in the playground can run into that bomb shelter. Can you imagine if our children and our grandchildren oh, had to know that any time they're out on a playground, they should be prepared if they heard the siren to run into a shelter? Um, it's just... But I was going to say, one of the questions I had when we were there was, why do these people stay here under mm -hmm. this country? I remember threat? you asking and, that. And she said, but this is home. This is home. Yep. This is their home. Um, you know, where would we go? Well, I, I love the question you asked, because if Americans asked this question, it would stop the silly moral equivalency that yes. Americans like to vacillate into. But if America had to deal with what they dealt with on an everyday basis, uh, we we wouldn't be fumbling around trying to figure out where no. where we stand. No. But again, on top of that, it, if you believe the Bible, you don't fumble around where you stand That's because right. um, the Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Israel, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and of course, there are now rockets uh, being fired toward Jerusalem. And so, yes. you know, we're taping this on Monday. Who knows what's going to happen by the time you watch this? on Tuesday, but I do know this, I know God is in control and, and this weekend, as strange as it may sound, we're going back into Clash 4 for the final sermon uh, on Israel. And uh, so bring your Bible and open it to the book of Revelation because we're gonna see something really interesting this coming weekend. Well, Mary Alice, I wanna go to the Bible uh, because the scripture that you felt the Holy Spirit leading you uh, to have for today's Noah's, Noah's window is so appropriate so appropriate for our friends in, in Israel and so appropriate for us here as believers at, at New Spring and other churches. And I know many of you, are, you watch Noah's Window, but you're part of fellowships of faith around the country. This verse is just so important. Uh, Jeremiah is in difficult times. Uh, he has to prophesy when the people of Israel, or Judah rather, are going to be attacked from Babylon. And God is trying desperately through Jeremiah to get the people to pay attention to him so that judgment can be stopped. And 
it's very clear that the people are not listening to Jeremiah, um, that judgment is going to happen. And here's what God says to Jeremiah, and I think we can take peace from this today. The Lord replied, I will take care of you, Jeremiah. Your enemies will ask you to plead on their behalf in times of trouble and distress. So let, let me just back up for a moment and explain what's going on. Jeremiah is prophesying what's going to happen to the people if they don't turn around. They don't want to hear it. They want Jeremiah to shut up. Eventually, they'll demand that Jeremiah be arrested. But what God is saying to him is, look, judgment hasn't started yet. And when it starts, two things are going to happen. God said, I'm going to take care of you. And those same people that have been making fun of you and ripping you, they're going to come and ask you to pray for them. So Mary Alice, I know we're talking about a specific time in the history of Judah, but I think this verse has something to say to you and me today. Absolutely. And not only were the people at large opposed to Jeremiah, but I think maybe even more importantly, the other prophets yes. were oh, attacking yes. him because they didn't like his message. Well, of course, they were false prophets mm -hmm. because they didn't really have a word from God. And because Jeremiah's true word from God was contradicting them, they would attack Jeremiah. They, they attacked his message, and eventually they attacked him yes, himself. Yeah. So um, I think Jeremiah felt like he couldn't win on any, on any level. Well, these prophets and priests were popular with the people who didn't like Jeremiah's message. And we didn't read this today, but... You and I have read in our one-year Bible, these prophets, they were doing the same things that these people were doing. They were into, you know, having their own estates and their own, you know, their own... It's all about their money own, and, and they were, power, They were yes. getting drunk and throwing parties. Mm -hmm. Well, if these prophets are doing that, they don't want to hear what Jeremiah says. No, they don't say. want to hear those messages. And I think that is a parallel to today, too. We need to be able to distinguish clearly what is a true uh, message from God. And what is a false message and in our culture and in our country there are a lot of so-called people that are saying what god says or what god should doesn't say but it isn't true to the word and we need to be careful to discern truth from error um, and not be taken in just because uh, someone says they're a prophet now there were more of them than of jeremiah <laughs> that's so always it the case. seemed like he was you know like he couldn't be right because there were more of them but I think we need to scratch below the surface and um, and ask for God's guidance and to be to know that God's never going to contradict His word. Well, it's never a vote. Thank you. It's never a popularity contest. No. There were 850 prophets and priests of Baal and only one Elijah. You know, yes. there were a whole bunch of you know prophets, so-called on Ahab's payroll. There was only one Micaiah, but. Mm -hmm. God, of course, confirmed his word through Elijah, through Micaiah, through Jeremiah, and all his prophets. You know. I think it's interesting, that particular scripture about the enemies coming to Jeremiah when they're in times of distress. And I think that happens to us. I've seen that even in my own lifetime. People that, uh, in spite of what they've been taught in God's word, they have stubbornly refused and gone a different way. But then when it all falls apart, they run back. Um, but we do know in Jeremiah's case, at the end, when, it, when it's obvious that everything is going down, the king even calls for Jeremiah mm -hmm. secretly. Right. Secretly. He still doesn't want the, you know, he, he's still worried about the politics of things, and he calls him in secretly. He wants to know the truth. What's interesting to me is he wants to know the truth, but he doesn't respond to the truth. No. But he wants to know. It's a curiosity. And he thinks he can outwit God. Yeah, I, I, people are messed up on this. The reason why this king doesn't want to do what Jeremiah said, he's worried about the high cost of following God. Somebody needs to worry about the high cost of not following yes. God, you know? But aside from talking about prophets and Bible times and even preachers in our time, I know, I know this is going to mean something to several of you, if not a lot of you watching this on Noah's Window today. You have to be in an environment where you may be the only Christian. Yes. And maybe you're the only Christian where you work and you get made fun of and people call you names and laugh at you and all that kind of thing. And what's even more complicated is when you're, it's in your family. Yes. And you know, when you go to like, we've got the Thanksgiving holiday. coming up, you yep. know, and Christmas coming up, you know, it's possible for a family to rip a Christ follower and why do you, why do you not do this and why do you do this and all that? You know, it's hard. It's hard to stand alone. Yes. It's hard to be in the minority. But the Bible says this, that those people who are making fun of you, someday they're going to be in trouble and you're going to be the person they go looking for because they know you believe what you believe. And it's just such a, a warning to all of us 
not to cave under pressure and start trying to find middle ground or something. And the first thing God says to Jeremiah is, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. That's where it starts. And I believe we can claim that promise, although we're not Jeremiah, but when we're in that position, when we fill out number, but we are standing for the truth and we're standing for what God has called us to stand for, he'll take care of us. Well, and again, we see this later, no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. That's a strong statement, but I love the one that follows it even more. The Bible says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Mm. Heritage is an inheritance. It goes from generation to generation to generation. You know, whether you're talking about... uh, Abel or Moses or you know Joshua or you're talking about King David or you're talking about the prophets or you talk about the apostles or whatever the Bible doesn't say no weapon will be formed against you just said it won't prosper yes so we we can trust the Lord to take care of us and we can have the courage to stand alone because he'll take care well maybe we need to save some of this for tomorrow's yes (laughs) (laughs) so thank you for listening to a long Noah's window but Mary Alice would you pray for us yes let's pray oh father we come before you Uh, humbled by what we see and hear that's going on around us father and I just pray that you'd have mercy on those in Israel that are under attack I pray that you would um, give wisdom to those that are in leadership I pray that you just have mercy father we know that there are many there who don't believe in you um, but there are many there who do and I just pray father that you would um, in this time uh, reach so many people that have not yet looked to you may this be a time many will come to know you as their personal Savior But I just pray in a a broad sense, Father, that you would have your will done in this situation and that as you uh, bring victory, that we would give you the glory and the honor because we know that uh, Israel is still your country and your beloved people. And we just pray for for you to bring peace as you've instructed us to pray for peace for Jerusalem. And we just pray that you would work your will in your way. And uh, whatever happens, Father, we trust that you are going to be the victor and we're going to give you the glory and the honor. And for those of us over here in America, I pray that you'd help us to stand strong. Help us to remember that um, we are under attack as well and that we need to be looking to you. And thank you for your uh, promise to take care of us. And I just pray that we would all be humble before you and get our lives right with you uh, for whatever the future holds, that we can know that our hearts are in a place where we can trust that you will take care of us as well. For everyone that's watching or listening on Noah's Window today, I just pray a special blessing on their life, whatever the day holds, whatever the news that comes their way. I just pray that you would be present, draw them close to you, give them guidance, wisdom, comfort, peace, and all things may you be glorified. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying for us, Mary Alice, and for praying for Israel. Thank you for joining us on Notice When I know today went kind of long, but we had a lot to say. We so. did. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. God bless. See you soon.